Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled, The Role of the Church in the Community. We've had some very challenging lessons. I wonder what this one's going to be about. Jesus desired their good. That sounds interesting. This is lesson number seven for August 13 of 2016. I think you'll find it very interesting and challenging. But as always, we need to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to study your word with friends, to share what we have learned and what we can learn from your word. Guide us in our discussion today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you could guess from the title that we're going to focus on the experiences of Jesus, what talks about in the Gospels, and um, we're going to use, mix that with some experiences that people have had in modern times. Um, one Sabbath morning, or on Sabbath morning, during Sabbath school and worship service, skateboarders can often be seen rolling past the main doors of a local Seventh-day Adventist church. Why? because this church meets in a community youth center facility right next to a skateboard park. And if you thought these skateboarders were an unexpected annoyance, think again. Instead, in an effort to curb the rising youth crime rate, the government in their city built the park to provide a place for its youth to engage in wholesome recreation. When the youth center and skateboard park were finished, the government wanted a church congregation to hold its worship services in the community youth center facility. The community leaders felt that the presence of a church would have a positive moral influence on the youth who used the park. They invited several churches of various Christian denominations, but only one accepted the church that had Sabbath school and worship on Saturday morning. These Adventist church members were excited about moving into the center, for the skateboarders were part of the group they wanted to reach. I don't think you expected that as the way to introduce this lesson. <laughs> Well, let's take another unexpected introduction to this lesson. Look at Jonah, the book of Jonah in the Bible, starting with chapter 3, verse 4, and we're going to read a few verses. Jonah started, and you know the story of Jonah, I'm sure, um, after that incredible experience out in the Mediterranean, was swallowed by some kind of a big fish, and now he's been spit up and he's back home, and Jonah, God calls him again. It says here, Jonah started, I'm, I'm starting with Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, started through the city, and after walking a whole day, he proclaimed, in 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God's message, so they decided that everyone should fast, and all the people, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth to show that they had repented. When the king of Nineveh heard about it, he got up from his throne, took off his robe, put on sackcloth, and sat down in ashes. That's a pretty incredible experience, isn't it? He sent out a proclamation to the people of Nineveh that this is an order from the king and his officials. No one is to eat anything. All persons, cattle, and sheep are forbidden to eat or drink. All persons and animals must wear <laughs> sackcloth. I'm quite wondering what it would look like to see animals wearing sackcloth. But anyway. Um, God saw what they did. He saw that they had given up their wicked behavior, so he changed his mind and did not punish them as he said he would. And you know what Jonah's response was? Jonah was very un unhappy about this and became angry. So he prayed, Lord, didn't I say before I left home that this is just what you would do? Now, it's too bad we don't have that conversation recorded, you know, whatever else was involved in that conversation. That's why I did my best to run away to Spain. I knew that you are a loving and merciful God, always patient, always kind, and always ready to change your mind and not punish. Now, Lord, let me die. I'm better off dead than alive. The Lord answered, What right have you to be angry? Jonah went out east of the city and sat down. He made a shelter for himself and sat in its shade, waiting to see what would happen to Nineveh. Then the Lord God made a plant grow up over, uh, made a plant grow up over Jonah to give him some shade so that he would be more comfortable. Jonah was extremely pleased with the plant. At dawn, of course, the plant withers and dies where it meets it. So, what do we know about Jonah's background? You know, just to make the story a little more colorful. 2 Kings 14, 
starting with verse 24 and 25, is a very interesting past couple of verses. It's talking about Jeroboam II, who was the king of the northern country of Israel. He sinned against the Lord, followed the wicked example of his predecessor, King Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who led Israel into sin. He reconquered all the territory that had belonged to Israel from Hamath Pass in the north to the Dead Sea in the south. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, had promised through his servant, the prophet Jonah, son of Amittai, from gath -Hefer. So what does that tell you? He's been around. He's been around, okay. That's a good start. Anybody else want to make a suggestion? Just that he was really a prophet of God. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do we know about Gath Hever? Gath Hever was a, 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 a village that we, we, all we basically know about it is that Jonah came from there, but it was located about two uh, miles from Sephorus or Sephorus. What do we know about Sephorus? Roman garrison town. It was a big Roman garrison town. Do we know anything else important about it? Right next to Nazareth. Very close to Nazareth. So Jonah came from a little village that was very close to where Jesus grew up. That's interesting. So, and of course, both of these, well, the, actually, gath is sort of on the border, maybe even into Samaria, and Nazareth was just across the border into Galilee. Well, <clears throat> What do you think Jonah thought when he finally left for, for Nineveh? What did he have in mind? What do you think was going to happen? What did he think was going to happen? Well, he told God, this is <clears throat> what, I, I knew you were going to cave in. You'd, get, you'd be kind <laughs> and patient cave and forgiving, and, um, and now you've made a fool of me. Well, get, Jonah was hoping that he would be able to come back and say, I went there, I prophesied against that place, and I... As a result of my activities, I destroyed the capital of these Assyrians. Well, Wouldn't the fact that they seem to have had <coughs> a tomb of Jonah in that area indicates that he never did go back, that he may have stayed on yeah, well, for, I don't know how long, but at least long enough to Yeah. Somebody to claim him. By contrast, um, look at Luke 19 starting with verse 38. God bless the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory to God. Then some of the Pharisees, this of course you recognize, I hope, the passage. This is the story of Jesus', of, of Jesus triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd spoke to Jesus. Teacher, they said, <clears throat> command your disciples to be quiet. And Jesus answered, I tell you that if they keep quiet, the stones themselves will start shouting. He came close to the city, and when he saw it, he wept over it, saying, if you only knew today what is needed for peace, but now you cannot see it. So now, of course, you could guess that these two stories are told as a contrast. How do you compare the, the two prophets and the two cities? One was angry that it wasn't destroyed, and the other was sad that they hadn't repented. So well, it was going to be Yeah, destroyed. so they, uh, Jonah was angry that they had repented, mm -hmm. and Jesus was sad that they hadn't repented. Yeah, very, 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 very well said. Well, and the point is, of course, is that Jonah hated the people in Nineveh. Yes, Diane. In, in our Tuesday night Bible study group, we studied the, the book of Jonah a while back. And um, one of the questions that somebody threw out that I thought was really interesting was, would you rather have been Jonah or the people of Nineveh? Who did you like? Did you identify with them? And some people started off with like, well, Jonah was a prophet of God, and I would want to be more like Jonah. And I'm over there saying, hey, I want to be a Ninevite. I want to be the one confessing, making the changes, wanting to be obedient to, to God. And mm -hmm. we had a colorful conversation that evening about that. <laughs> I'm sure. There's a funny story that I guess I could share about a little girl who went to Sunday school and 
she came out and she was holding her little, uh, some kind of a little thing or something that said Joan on it. The guy came along the street and sort of started questioning her. She's waiting for, waiting for her parents to pick her up. And um, the guy says, do you really believe that Jonah story? Oh yes, the Bible says so. So he says, well, let me ask you a question. What do you think Jonah was praying for when he was down in the belly of that big fish? The little girl thought for a little bit. She says, I don't know, but maybe I'll ask him when I get to heaven. And the man says, well, what if Jonah doesn't go to heaven? And then she says, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> 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 I thought that was quite good. <laughs> yeah. uh, someone else said, a, a bunch of young kids also in another class said, well, the story of Jonah teaches that you can't keep a good man down. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, the story of Jesus doesn't end with the triumphal entry. You, as you remember, they, he came up to Jerusalem with this big crowd of people marching up from Jericho to Jerusalem, and they were sure that finally he was going to announce that he, was, he would be king. And what, five days later, six days later, well, a, a week after they had marched up from Jericho to Jerusalem, um, he was hanging out on the cross. Wow. Anyway, which of these two attitudes most, we're con contrasting now, of course, the attitude of Jonah and the attitude of Jesus. Which of these two attitudes most closely matches the attitude of the members of your church toward the surrounding community? I think every one of us will have to answer that question for your, ourselves, and you can do the same. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question that's raised in our, in our Bible study guide, asking about the anyway principle. What's the anyway principle? There was a country ballot a few years ago built around that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well. The words well, were? You want to hear the words? Some, I, I did. Yeah. Well, it was, uh, if I can find that page. Oh, yeah. Um, you can spend your whole life building something from nothing. One storm can come and blow it all away. Build it anyway. And I think mm. that's the. You can chase a dream that seems so out of reach, and you know it might never c come your way. Dream it anyway. And then the chorus went: God is great, but sometimes life ain't good. And when I pray. It doesn't always turn out like I think it should, but I do it anyway. Mm -hmm. I do it anyway. Very and good. And there's several other uh, well, illustrations. The illustrations they use in this lesson is lepers were supposed to stay six feet away from healthy people, but Jesus touched one and cleansed him anyway. Peter denied Jesus three times, but Jesus reinstated him as a disciple anyway. The church at Corinth was having all kinds of problems despite Paul's best efforts. But Paul served them anyway. So what does this anyway principle re reveal about the character of those who are true Christians? Disinterested benevolence. Meaning you serve people because they have a need and not because it's convenient or because you like them or... Because or you're going to get something out of it. You're going to get something out of it. Yeah. Ellen White wrote these words in Desire of Ages, page 640, paragraph 3. Millions upon millions of human souls ready to perish, bound in chains of ignorance and sin, have never so much as heard of Christ's love for them. Were our condition and theirs to be reversed, what would we desire them to do for us? All this, and so far as lies in our power, we are under the most solemn obligation to do for them. Christ's rule of life, by which every one of us must stand or fall in the judgment, is... Whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them, and you recognize the golden rule from Matthew seven twelve. That's is that an impossible standard? On our own, yes. Yeah. Okay. Is it really possible just to love your enemies? It, it, you'll read articles here and there of people that have come to terms with that and have. It's not easy to do from what I can gather. Mm -hmm. and I, was, it, was it Abraham Lincoln that said the best way to destroy your enemies is to make friends out of them? Yeah. <laughs> I think that would be, that would be a good suggestion. Um, we all know the famous 
passages, and maybe I should just review that. Matthew 5, starting with verse 43. You've heard that it was said, love your friends, hate your enemies. But now I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may become the children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun to shine on bad and good people alike. He gives rain to those who are good and those who do evil. Why should God reward you if you love only the people who love you? Even the tax collectors do that. I wonder what Matthew thought when they heard him say that. And if you speak only to your friends, have you done anything out of the ordinary? Even the pagans do that. You must be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, what keeps us from... Go ahead. Silence. Yeah. That's, that's a tough one. Yeah. What well, keeps us from loving our enemies? Well, resistance to what Jesus said. Uh, he, uh, you know, Ellen White says all his biddings are enablings. Mm -hmm. And if you think of his word as being creative, then when he says do this, there is the power to do that in that, in that expression of it. So if we have the faith to believe what he said, then we can walk in that as long as we don't resist. Do we as Seventh-day Adventists have any group enemies? Some would say so. Yeah. Some would say so, okay. Do we have any personal enemies? Sometimes. Sometimes. What can we do to, to deal with personal enemies or group enemies? Can I share a little of yeah. story? Um, when I was working over at West Valley, there was a supervisor. We, we, people don't know what West Valley is. You were West Valley Detention Center is the, the county jail. Mm -hmm. There was one nursing supervisor that I did not like. She was rude. She was, it wasn't just to me. It, she was, everybody just said, well, that's just the way she is. And she was just really unkind and rude to everybody. I, so I decided that I was going to pray for her. And after a few months, you know, that just was not, not making any kind of a change. So somewhere along the line, I said, you know, maybe I need to pray that I'm going to be better, kinder, you know, make a difference. And because um, I'm not always kind and thoughtful either. You're and, not perfect? Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> so I started praying we'll that I would be, that, you know, that I would be able to just be more thoughtful of her. And um, I can't say that it changed her, but it did change me. And afterwards, people would come up to me and say, how, how do you put up with, you know, some of that stuff that she does and says, you know, to you and everybody else? And... It's just like not going to be on her level. Mm -hmm. And like I said, praying for her just didn't get the job done. Praying for me made the change. Wonderful. Very good. Thank you, Diane. Well, there are millions, even billions of God's children who have never even heard about him. And how does he, how does he relate to them? He takes care of them, they, even if they hate him. And there's an interesting verse found in Romans 2 verse 4 which says or perhaps you despise his great kindness tolerance and patience surely you know that God is kind because he's trying to lead you to repent surely you know that God is kind because he's trying to lead you to repent and here's a very kind of a sorry note but think about this is it possible that God is kind to his wicked children because if they never repent this is the only opportunity he will have to show his love to them. God's kindness might actually lead to their repentance and conversion. And then, of course, the question would be for us, could we be God's arms, hands, and feet to reach out to those he wants to love? Well, it's no surprise to faithful Christians that love is a preeminent characteristic of, of God. And we, we've talked about that here many times, that Satan's kingdom is built on what principle? Selfishness. Selfishness. And God's kingdom is built on? Love. Now, it, 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 those are, I mean, you can just, 
can, you can basically describe all the characteristics of God's kingdom, and there you have love. And you can describe all the characteristics of Satan king, Satan's kingdom, and there you have selfishness. I mean, those two words just about nail it right on the head. Well, we know that um, Jesus, well, both in the Old Testament, back in, num uh, I'm sorry, back in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, said the number one thing we're supposed to do is love who? God. And then love our neighbors, right? So, um, who are those neighbors? Well, we, we, have, we have talked a lot about the story of the Good Samaritan. Um, absolutely incredible story. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, uh, in a few moments. Why do some other groups in the world hate Christians? Think about some of the wars that are going on right now. Could it possibly be, in some cases, because of the behavior of Christians themselves? Because they're not very Christ-like? Well, notice these comments about and from Mahatma Gandhi of India, the famous peace man. I would really encourage you, if you get a chance, to read the entire article that's listed there. When Gandhi was questioned by the Christian missionary E. Stanley Jones why he rejected becoming a follower of Christ, he stated, Oh, I don't reject Christ. I love Christ. It's just that so many of you Christians are so unlike Christ. If Christians would really live according to the teachings of Christ as found in the Bible, all of India would be Christian today. Can you imagine that? I don't know. He must have been exaggerating a little bit, but wow. Could that possibly be true? Sure makes you wonder yeah. what all was going on in India that time. Mm -hmm. And then, what about here at home? Well, the interesting thing about India is that right now there's an almost an explosion in the Adventist church in India. Millions of people are hearing about the gospel and coming. And one of the, the some of the, there are a few states in India which have now made it illegal to change your religion. And guess where the church is growing? Our church is growing the fastest. Right there. In those Why areas, is that? Always seems to be the way persecution makes things grow. You look at all up through the mountains up there in Nepal and right on up into Tibet, right through there into China, there's a growth of Christianity that's never been like it before. Yeah. I, I don't want to think about this very much, but just scan back through history and think of some terrible things that people have done, even in the name of the church. I mean, how many wars, even when the Protestant Reformation got started? I mean, you know, back and forth. There's a very interesting <laughs> grave marker in England. The, I've forgotten which one was first. One side of it is the name of uh, a Catholic that was killed by Protestants. On the other side of the grave, the same grave marker is a, is a marker for, uh, um, see, I said it was Protestant killed by Catholic, Catholics killed by Protestants. On the other side is a Protestant killed by Catholics. <laughs> and of course we know about Northern Ireland and everything that was going on there for a long time. Well, it's interesting to notice if you read Daniel 7, 24 and 25, God had an idea that some of this was coming. The ten horns are ten kings who will rule that empire. Then another king will appear. He will be very different from the early ones and will overthrow three kings. He will speak against the supreme God and oppress God's people. He will try to change their religious laws and festivals. And God's people will be under his power for three and a half years. And Adventists have used that verse and talked about it for a long time. Um, do you think it could have recurrent meaning in the future? Yes. Do you think it's true, uh, as some have said, that more wars have been started in the name of religion than for any other cause? No. Uh, it's said, in fact, uh, you hear it from all kinds of people who are atheists and such, but it's more p propaganda than anything. Uh, actually, religion is the cause of a very small minority of wars. Phillips and Axelrod's three-volume Encyclopedia of Wars lays out the simple facts. In five millennia worth of wars, 1,763 total, only 123, or about 
were religious in nature. Furthermore, if you remove the 66 wars waged in the name of Islam, that number is cut down to a little more than 3%. Uh, a second scholarly source, the Encyclopedia of War, edited by Gor Gordon Martell, confirms this data, including that only, concluding that only 6% of the wars listed in its pages can be labeled religious wars. And if you look at, um, let's see, indeed, um, strong case can be made for athe that atheism, not religion, and certainly not Christianity, is responsible for a far greater degree of bloodshed. Indeed, R.J. Rummel's work in his books, Lethal Politics and Death by Government, has the secular body count at more than 100 million in the 20th century alone. Millions have died at the hands of atheist regimes like Mao Zedong, uh, Joseph Stalin, Adolf Hitler, Hitler Vladimir Lenin, and uh, Pot Pol in Cambodia and others. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, people will use that as propaganda, but it's not true. Well, and, and, and the comment I added here is that even the people who start wars, so called, so supposedly in the name of religion, most time it's because they want to start a war, they want to increase themselves, they want to do something, but they want, they want to think of a good excuse that might attract people to join them, and so they come up with some kind of a religious excuse for... Right. Uh, whatever will manipulate the people and whatever's it, popular. Yeah, it's certainly not because Christians really act like Jesus. Well, in light of these ideas, would it not be even more important for true Christians to exhibit the love of God to those around them? Have you ever taken 1 Corinthians 13 apart and look at what it says, just sort of in, in columns or something like that? Notice what Paul says about what love is and what love does. He also said what love is not and what love does not do. And so I worked on that a little bit. Love is patient and kind not happy with evil, happy with the truth, eternal. Love does never give up. It has faith and hope and patience. It's pa faith, hope, and patience never fail. Love is not jealous or conceited or proud, ill-mannered or selfish or irritable. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. So what would we learn from that list? The Book of Life and the Book of the Dead, apparently that's... Yeah. yeah, just about, huh? The next um, story that the lesson asks us to take up is a very interesting one found in Mark 8, starting with verse 22. Let me just read that. There's just three or four verses here. They came to Bethsaida. What do we know about Bethsaida? Anybody? There's a pool there. Well, there was a pool of Bethsaida, but that was in Jerusalem. This is, the, this is the little town of Bethsaida. And in actual fact, the pool of Bethsaida in Jerusalem, is, that's probably a misnomer. It really should, should be Bethsatha, because it's in the section of Jerusalem by the name of Bethsatha, and nobody has figured out where the Bethsaida came from, so it probably was supposed to be the pool of Bethsatha. Pool of Beth well, anyway, I, I, I won't spend more time on that, but it's, it's probably the, the pool there is, in Jerusalem is probably misnamed. Bethsaida, or Bethsaida, is located in the very northern tip of the, of the Sea of Galilee. What else can you tell me about it? Well, it was included in the woes that Jesus, woe to you Chorazin, woe mm -hmm. to you Bethsaida, for yep. if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Exactly. Do we know any people who came from Bethsaida? Peter and Andrew grew up there, and so did James and John. They started out in the early, early years, came from there. This was their hometown. Yeah. Okay, well, and, and of course this time he's not too far. He's not in Bethsaida itself. Um, Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. After spitting on the man's eyes, Jesus placed his hands on him and asked him, Can you see anything? The man looked up and said, Yes, I see people, but they look like trees walking about. Jesus again placed his hands on the man's eyes. This time the man looked intently, his eyesight returned, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus then sent him home with the order, Don't go back into the village. 
Now, there's several strange things in that story. Um, first of all, why did Jesus heal him in two steps? I mean, think of all the times Jesus just commanded and it happened. I've but heard it asked, did Jesus fail? Yeah. Yes. Or partially fail in this? Yeah. Okay. Is that what happened? It's probably to keep people from thinking their first ideas are good. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, I should back up a little bit. Why did he take him outside of the town? I mean, wouldn't it be better just to let everybody watch it, what, he, what he's doing there? Yeah, and told him not to go back in there. He told him not to go back into the town. Don't publicize this. Don't publicize it. Okay? Why would he say that? Where are we in his ministry? In Jesus' We're, we're near the, close to the end of his ministry. Mm hmm Oh, could it be a metaphor? He was showing them a metaphor that you have to leave something to to um, get in a better situation. Well, let's let's be honest. First of all, the Bible doesn't give us an explanation of why he did this thing. So we're sort of hypothetical here. Some people have suggested that he did it in two steps because the man's face was very weak at the beginning. So by partially healing him, and the man says, wow, I, I, I could start to see, and he would have more faith that he could be healed completely. I guess that's as good a guess as anybody. Uh, why did Jesus spit on his eyes? That doesn't sound very good to us, does it? You must not have traveled as a child with my mother. <laughs> 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 Isn't that how the, you clean children's faces? Yeah. Of course, of course. <laughs> Well, the ancient peoples actually believed that saliva had medicinal properties. So, um, even though Jesus may have known exactly how medicinal saliva really was, um, he probably did that in, in light of their, their beliefs, their ideas. Well, you spent in a couple other places, a chapter back, yeah. in chapter 7, he spit on someone's tongue. Yes. And then in John 9, 6, uh, he mixed uh, spit with clay. Mm -hmm. um, and that was also on the Sabbath, as yes. you brought out some time back about uh, one of the laws that you couldn't spit on the dirt because that would be making clay. Not, but not only that, he put it on his eyes. It was forbidden to put any kind of medicinal anything above the neck on the Sabbath. And then he had to go wash it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, our Bible study, a Bible study guide suggests that we compare this story with Mark 7, 31 to 37, the story of a deaf mute. Jesus then, and you mentioned the, the yeah. tongue here, Jesus then left the neighborhood of Tyre and went on to Sidon to Lake Galilee. So this, uh, Myra, you were asking about where we are in his story. Yeah. So here he is. He's during the retirement period of his, the, the, not the last six months, but the six months just before that where he's taken his disciples outside of Jewish territory and really trying to focus on them and concentrate on them to, to get them prepared for what he knows is coming, but they have no idea what's coming. So, some people brought him a man who was deaf and could hardly speak, and they begged Jesus to place his hands on him. So Jesus took him off alone, notice again, took him off alone, away from the crowd, put his fingers in the man's ears, spat and touched the man's tongue, then Jesus looked up to heaven, gave a deep groan, and said to the man, Ephatha, which means open up. At once the man was able to hear. His speech impediment was removed and began to talk without any trouble. Then Jesus ordered the, man, the people not to speak of it to anyone. But the more he ordered them not to the, to, the more they spoke. And all who heard they were completely amazed how well he does everything, they exclaimed. He even causes the deaf to hear and the dumb to speak. So now Jesus is in... Gentile territory doing this stuff. Um, why would he tell the Gentiles not to tell? Would it make any difference whether it was a Gentile or a Jew? <clears throat> Depends on whether you're a Jew or not. Mm. I see. I think there's kind of a message there that everybody else sees that he's not doing it to call attention to himself. Okay. Very Even good. though there is some there seems like there should be a reason to call attention to himself, but yeah. but um, 
it's it's something that maybe we shouldn't do when we go out and do our well and and, good and, thing. and we've talked about this before but I want to keep emphasizing this this idea part of the reason he did this kind of stuff all the time was he knew that if people started if the rumors got even more spread than they already were that he was going to be the Messiah and people had completely wrong ideas about what the Messiah was going to do so he said I, he didn't want to start any you know big movements that would try to force him to be the kind of king they wanted and th that kind of stuff so if he healed in public all the time and people spread that word people would come for the wrong reason they'd be mm -hmm. Healing Christians instead of race Christians. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that would be a good thing. I, I'm a healing doctor. I am a healing Christian. Well, yeah, but he wanted them to. He wanted to tell them about the the yeah. Father. He wanted to save their souls, so to speak. When new people are converted and join the Seventh Day Adventist Church in our communities, do we do they see everything clearly from the start? No. And this is a challenge. It's a real challenge for pastors. Uh, and I, I understand this. I, I've had differences with some pastors a few times. You can't wait until they understand every doctrine and every detail perfectly. But at what point in time, there's, there's some pastors who want to baptize people as soon as they sort of show any interest at all. And say, well, we, after they become church members, we can go ahead and keep working with them. Unfortunately, often they don't, and pretty soon those people are out the back door. But uh, that's a challenge for pastors to know, okay, how far along do people have to be before you decide it's appropriate to baptize them? How oh. long did it take Paul to baptize the Philippian jailer? Yeah, I mean Philip? Oh, the Philippian jailer, yes, right. And how long did it take Philip to baptize the Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch? Yeah. yeah. On the spot, almost. Do we ever baptize groups of people just to impress someone with our numbers? No. <laughs> Unfortunately, it wouldn't surprise me to say yes. I can tell you about, there's a place that near where I used to work in Kenya where almost 50% of the population are Seventh-day Adventists, an area in Kenya. And a gentleman came from the United States big, really big guy, and he came, he's an evangelist here, and he went out there and conducted an evangelistic series, and of course, you know, this is rural Kenya, and there's not much else going on, and people just flock to hear this American evangelist had come out there, and he baptized 3,000 people in a series of, I, th I think it was there, three or four weeks, and how many what percentage of those people do you think were still in the church uh, a year later? Single digit numbers? Very, very few. Well, I've heard situations where a, a well-known preacher was going to go to Africa or something and they held off on all the baptisms until he got there. Yeah. And so there's a whole bunch, about a whole year's worth of of um, normal baptisms or something. Yeah, of, of com converts. He kind of held off until he got there to baptize everybody, and then he came back with this huge number, and he could put on his well, that would paper be, and everything. Yeah. It was pretty. That would be a little <laughs> better, but it's still a little yeah. sort of artificial, yeah. isn't it? Well, it impresses some people to give money, though. I hate to say it. Well, <laughs> Jesus, a little bit later in the in in Mark, Jesus talks about another kind of blindness. Look at Mark 8, starting with verse 14. It's actually a little bit earlier, I should say. The disciples had forgotten to bring enough bread and had only one loaf with them in the boat. Take care, Jesus warned them, and be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees in the east of Herod. They started discussing among themselves, he says this because we haven't any bread. Now, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure I'm dumb, and there's some areas that I miss things. But I would have thought, after being around Jesus for a while, and realizing that he knows everything <laughs> that's going on, I wouldn't be trying to discuss something on the side with trying to even pretend that Jesus didn't know what was going on. But anyway. You think they, they should have known that he was reading everybody's minds? Of course. Really? It happened so many times. I mean, how many times does that have to happen to you before you figure it out? I don't know. It, it, 
it sounds to me like you know it's it's a little bit natural, but but um, I mean we we think oh yeah well of course he's the son of God so, but th they didn't think that kind of stuff at that point in time. They said, you know, even when they were getting into the upper room there, where they're at last meal with Jesus, they were still arguing about who was going to be prime minister. Well, sometimes you got to just let the steam go out because that's <laughs> probably what you're thinking about all the time and uh, finally right. they did it. Well, Jesus said, don't you know or understand yet? Are, you, are your minds so dull? So guess what? You have eyes, can't you see? You have ears, can't you hear? Don't you remember when I broke the five loaves to the 5,000 people? How many baskets full of leftover pieces did you take up? Twelve, they answered. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000 people, asked Jesus, how many basketfuls full of leftover pieces did you take up? Seven, they answered. And you still don't understand, Jesus asked them? He, he asked them. <laughs> yeah. It's very interesting when you, when, you, when you can read the Greek to read those stories because the baskets that, of, of pieces left over that they collected when they fed the 5,000 were very, very typical Jewish baskets. And the seven baskets, that, that was the 12 baskets, and the seven baskets that were, that were used when they collected peace over in the Gentile territory were de definitely Gentile baskets. Yeah. Uh, very interesting, just, just to show you the little interesting little bits of things that you miss. Yeah, so do you have 12 tribes of Israel in the one case and seven churches in the other <laughs> case? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Into numerology. Seven and twelve is a good number. It goes all the way through the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> this is another place. Some people say that the four thousand and five thousand is just uh, it's the same same uh, same group. But this is another place that says not only are there different facts about it, but here he says explicitly there was this occasion and then there was yep. this occasion. Exactly. I mean, it, it's too much to believe that Jesus could have fed all those people twice. You know. Well, you know, how, how often do you kind of remember what the Lord has done for you in the past when something else comes up to you mm -hmm. right now? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's kind of difficult. You have to kind of make yourself do it. And if okay. you don't, you're not going to remember. Okay. So my question then would be, how often does the Lord weep over our blindness today? Over our what? Our blindness like the disciples' blindness? Is there a reason why we're 172 years after the Great Disappointment and we're still here? You aren't saying that we're blind, are you? How could that ever happen? Isn't that what the, the Laodicean church is all about? Buy of me eye salve so you can see. One of the things. Well, in our last lesson, we talked about churches in cities, churches to cities, and churches with cities. Now we want to talk about others-centered churches. And th probably the best example of that, not of a church, but of a person, um, is found in Philippians 2. I'm going to read verses 3 to 5. Don't be, do anything from selfish ambition or from a cheap desire to boast, but be humble towards one another, always considering others better than yourselves. And look out for one another's interests, not just for your own. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had, and then it goes on to describe his incredible but coming down from, you know, from heaven and all the way down to being, dying the death of a common criminal. And that's the attitude we're supposed to have. I, uh, I was called to jury duty today and we were meeting in a beautiful new building up on the fifth floor and a wonderful new courthouse. And while I was waiting to be called into the chambers to, to be, or our group was waiting to be quizzed, I looked out the window and there's a park right next to the big, beautiful new building. And here were a bunch of homeless people out there in tents and some without tents and so forth. And a lady was scooping dirty water out of a half, just a few, a few puddles left in what, what should have been a small stream. And she's trying to wash some of her clothes with this, scooping out with a little thing like this. 
and you think, well, look at this. Here we are in this beautiful new high-rise building, and right there beside us is all these homeless people. Well, Jesus is right. The poor will always be with us. It doesn't matter how many big buildings we have around us. Mm -hmm. Well, what would it take for a group of Adventists to become totally other-centered? Could that happen? Well, it could. You need to be empty sure. vessels waiting to be filled with God's Spirit. I was, this morning, listening to, I have audio materials on the book of Ministry of Healing, and she makes some statements in there that just almost blew me away. We can be filled with the divine if we just allow the Holy Spirit to come into our lives. We can be filled with the divine. What do you think is going to happen when you do that? You might become other-centered. Which is? You think of other people before you think, about, think of yourself. Which is? It's called love. Back to love. <laughs> Well, here on this earth, Jesus' life was often a life of interruptions. One day during his ministry, he was called urgently to the home of Jairus, whose daughter was dying. We know the story. Even while on his way he, to deal with that interruption, he was interrupted further by the woman who had dealt with a bleeding disorder for 12 years and wanted to just touch the edge of his garment. I, I sometimes think that my life is just one continuous interruption. <laughs> And I, I, can, I can identify with that completely. Well, <clears throat> so now let's talk about how we would go about this. Could we, could we set a goal, okay, this year all the Adventists in our church are going to become other-centered? Think that would work? What would that look like? Would we be taking homeless people in? What would your method be? What would your method be? I mean, that's, that's got to be the good news right there. What is it that you will be other-centered, whatever that means? I think, I think in order for something like that, I mean, even remotely, to be even remotely possible, people would have to, one, really, really be committed to it, and two, really want to do it, and then they would have to meet together on a regular basis saying, okay, how can we reach out? Um, so that's the recipe, you think? Well, I, I think that would be a start. Well, it starts with prayer and, and personal interaction, reaching out, like in Matthew 18, to those who have differences with us, showing them love and concern, and then praying together in groups, pressed together, as she often says, pressed together. Yeah. Uh, and encouraging one another, uh, trying to lift each other up instead of tearing each other down. Yeah. Um, and then study groups, trying to study together uh, um, how to become spiritual men and women, and then individual loving in our neighborhoods, in our jobs, uh, no condemnation or doubt, but bring them to Jesus, and don't try to give what you don't have, which is often one of the things that we stumble on. We try to oversell ourselves what we have. One time I was called, well, I was called to to go to Tanzania to work there. I didn't know how long I was going to be. I ended up being there for seven years. But I just barely arrived in Africa, and the church said, oh, we, need, we, we can't send you to Tanzania just yet. We need someone to fill in because we have this clinic in Nairobi, Kenya, that needs a doctor for three or four months until the, the new doctor arrives. So I, I said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And I won't go into all the details, but we lived in an upstairs apartment right next to the dentist who worked on, he worked on the bottom floor and we worked on the, I worked on the next floor and then our houses were at the top floor of this building. And it was amazing the opportunities we seemed to have for witnessing there. Every night we would get, there was a veranda out in front of all three of our, um, there were three apartments there in a row. And we would come out there and say, okay, what have you heard from the Lord today? That was our standard question. And one of the other of us would always have some kind of an incredible story about something that had 
you know, taken place that day. And it, it just, I, that's the kind of things I think about when, uh, when people ask these kind of things. Now, obviously one of the things we, we focus on are, are baptisms. And, and that's right. I mean, Matthew 28, 19 to 20 says, Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I'll be with you always to the end of the age. But could we go a step beyond that? What about trying to do what it says in John 10.10? 10? The thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come in order to, that you might have life, life in all its fullness. What would that mean? Life in all its fullness. Is that more than just baptizing them? I think it's the power to live. Uh, the might have life and have it more abundantly is another translation of that. And, and a lot of times people think of that life as being the experience of life, that you're just going to have all of these experiences. But I think the word is, has, is, that's used there, Zoe, is more mm -hmm. expressive of the power of life, whereas mm -hmm. suke, the other word that's used for life most often, has more the connotation of experience and activity mm -hmm. of life. So, yeah. And I've heard people kind of excuse, you know, Jesus said we should have abundant life, so let's, you know, party. <laughs> let's, yeah, well, of course. Let's, I, I, you know, do everything and, and such. Mm -hmm. And, and that, I think that isn't what he was saying. Uh, when, he, when he used the other word, suke, he was saying he who seeks to save his life shall lose it. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a very interesting paragraph in the Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Thursday, August 11. It says, one church was running a much-needed soup kitchen in a depressed area of town. The pastor was heard saying, we must close this soup kitchen because no baptisms are coming from it. Another congregation had just built a new church building. They were very proud of it. When the pastor suggested inviting the community to come inside the church for such events as vacation Bible school or health screenings to expose, church, to expose people to the environment of the church, the first consideration was feared that the new carpet would get dirty and worn. And the new bathrooms might get defaced. Contrast these two churches with the church that was meeting in the skateboard park. Why is it so difficult for us to accomplish the things discussed in this lesson? Really being like Jesus? Ellen White says this, In order to reach all classes, we must meet them where they are. For they will seldom seek us of their own accord. Not alone from the pulpit are the hearts of men and women touched by divine truths. Christ awakened their interest by going among them as one who desired their good. He sought them at their daily avocations and manifested an unfeigned interest in their temporal affairs. And that's found in My Life Today, page 186 and several other locations as well. Diane, before we finish, I know that uh, you reach out? You're with a group that reaches out. Uh, tell me a little bit, just briefly, about what you do down there. There, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, there are three different teams, and we make breakfast for mm. um, people, and anyone who shows up, we feed them. And um, we have some regulars that are always there. Um, one of them actually has made big changes in his life and he sort of watches out and polices and if people start getting out of line he helps us out with that. Um, and recently the, the city was not sure they wanted some of these um, people with, you know, they're homeless. Le less than desirable people. Yeah, that's, I think that's the polite version. Um, we've done everything we can to um, have the place look better and to get it spruced up. And I'm really proud of the university church that, um, that they have backed us and supported us and advocated for us to keep that, that um, place open. So um, then on Sabbaths, um, the young adults from the, um, the Relive group um, take turns and um, go down on Sabbath morning have they you know they bring breakfast and they um, they have a, a, um, a short speaker and um, 
I just think that this is a um, a really grassroots outreach that um, that we can do in our own community. I always used to be kind of entertained about um, health education students that wanted to get on a plane and fly someplace and be a missionary. <laughs> and I just finally told some of them, you know, five miles on a bike and you're in, you're in like a foreign country. You mm -hmm. can you can do these kinds of good things close by. And um, it's been it's been very interesting. We have some really dedicated, kind people that um, that just open their hearts, their foods. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a story told about a Christian who was asked, what is the purpose of your life? And his answer was, to give and ask nothing in return. Mm -hmm. How many Christians do you think would give an answer like that? Could we truly have the attitude that Jesus had? And I just mentioned Philippians 2, that's one place, but we, the whole, story, whole life of Jesus, what kind of an impact does it have on people when someone shows genuine love and care for them? What simple but practical ways can we do that in our communities? Can you think of any other examples in which Jesus reached out to people to do them good? As we know, there are constant gatherings of people in all kinds of different gatherings, in different kinds of situations. Could those gatherings whatever they are, could they be used as an opportunity for putting in a good word for the Lord? Could we be the hands, the feet, and the voice of Jesus Christ to our communities? Could we learn to reach out in love and in practical ways do them good? There are many examples in the Bible in which Jesus ate with people, using it as a time to build friendships and stronger social bonds. Luke particularly, who focuses on women, mentions many of these in, the, in our handout, which, by the way, is available on our website at theox.org. Uh, it has all those places. We, get to, we still get together in small groups. Corinth was a wicked city. When Paul first went there, he wondered if he should even stay there. It seemed so bad. But then, in his first letter, he talked about some of their problems, and he still, God says, no, I, I have a, a work for you to do in Corinth, and he stayed there, and had a tremendous response, as we know. So in your community, in your church, what could you do to reach out? Our kind and wonderful Father, you've presented to us with some real challenges. Um, it's, it's hard even to understand where we should begin sometimes, but we know that you have a plan that would work, and we just ask for your guidance so that we may do our part in carrying it out. And may that start soon so that your coming may be soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.